All right, y'all, welcome back to Comet Arms Channel. So this is going to be a reaction video to the raid on Pebble Island. Now, I wasn't familiar with this raid at all until y'all were recommending it on my uh, Falklands War reaction. So I was pretty interested to check it out. So I know the SAS and the, the Royal Marines and the Paras were doing a lot of awesome things during the Falkl Falkland Wars. But I wasn't familiar with this raid and I, I wasn't aware of how big of a success it actually was. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the raid on Pebble Island, it happened in May of 1982. And basically what the mission was, it was for these, I think it was 45 SAS operators to go to the airfield on Pebble Island and destroy all the aircraft. Now the Argentine Air Force during the Falkland War was pretty effective. So that's why the, uh, the United Kingdom was trying to target their aircraft to make sure they wouldn't be able to use uh, Pebble Island as a forward operating base as effectively. So this video, we'll get into the, the specifics a little bit more, I'm sure. So we'll just, uh, we'll get right into it. Now again, if you guys haven't seen my merch, there's a link down in the description, feel free to check it out. But we'll get right into the video. Argentina had successfully invaded the British colony of the Falkland Islands on the 2nd of April 1982. Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher determined that the islands, British since 1833 and home to 1,800 settlers, would be recaptured and dispatched the largest British military expedition mounted since the 1956 Suez Crisis in Egypt to get them back. A primary factor in any successful campaign to retake the Falklands was air superiority, and Britain faced a serious problem. The Falklands are 8,000 miles from the UK, and Britain was completely reliant on Sea Harrier aircraft flying off of two aircraft carriers to achieve and maintain air superiority before launching an amphibious invasion. Yeah, so when you're talking about an operation so far from home, you're going to need those aircraft carriers just to make sure that you can actually implement your, your air superiority, your try and maintain air superiority. If you don't have the aircraft carriers uh, or a sufficient amount, it's going to be very taxing for the Air Force to try and do these long missions, if not impossible. So I, I think the United States actually let the, the UK use one of their aircraft carriers. Uh, I'm not too sure on that one, so y'all might have to fact check me on that one. But yeah, again, with, the, with having to use aircraft carriers, it's a huge consideration and trying to work around it is pretty difficult, especially from the United Kingdom to Argentina. Yeah, it's, it's pretty far. So when you're talking about air superiority, it was much easier for Argentina to maintain it just because they had all these forward operating bases inside the area, all these airfields that they can just send these aircraft from. So like maintenance and logistics, resupply was a lot easier for them uh, than it was for the United Kingdom. The Falklands are only 400 miles from Argentina, which enabled the Argentines to use fast jets to sortie and attack British ships and land forces. Argentina also based aircraft on the islands themselves, including useful ground attack aircraft at a local airstrip on Pebble Island, lying north of West Falkland. Three types of aircraft were at Pebble Island, two of them dangerous to the proposed British landings. There were six FMA I-858 Pucaras, a twin-engine turboprop ground attack and counter-insurgency aircraft armed with bombs, rockets and machine guns. As well as those based at Pebble Island, there were several at Goose Green Airfield on the Falklands. Three of these aircraft were taken out by Royal Navy Sea Harriers dropping cluster bombs on the 1st of May 1982. Okay, so being being infantry and talking from an infantry perspective, uh, I don't really know anything about aircraft. I know I know very very little. Uh, I'd say minimum as far as uh, aircraft, especially when you're talking about older aircraft. So I won't be able to talk a whole lot uh, on the the effectiveness of those. Now I do know the Argentine Air Force was pretty effective during the war, um, but I know the Harriers were also putting in a lot of work from the United Kingdom. Now again, coming from the infantry perspective, I can say if you don't have air superiority, it's going to be very, very difficult. It's not possible for you to actually accomplish your mission, um, you know, because you won't have the air support if things go bad. You don't have that air support to come in and help you out, get you out of a rough situation because you'll have the, the you know, the, the enemy's air force constantly uh, harassing you, harassing your aircraft, making sure that they keep their airspace clear. So it's going to be very difficult and very um 
disheartening to be going against a, an enemy that has air superiority. So I can say that must have been pretty rough um, for those times where the, U the United Kingdom didn't necessarily have that air superiority. It's very hard to plan around that, uh, especially when you're trying to do operations where you might need a little bit longer sustainment. The Argentine Navy based four Turbo Mentor light attack aircraft at Pebble Island that could carry bombs and gun pods. And there was a single Coast Guard short SC-7 Skyvan utility transport aircraft. Reconnaissance missions flown by the Pucaras and Mentors might compromise Royal Navy operations, preparatory to their insertion of the landing force to recapture the islands. It was decided to give the job of neutralizing the threat to the famed Special Air Service Regiment, the SAS, the original Special Forces unit that had been much imitated but never surpassed. Pebble Island had a population of 25 British people and 25,000 sheep. The Argentines moved in aircraft, personnel and stores. The airfield was protected by a platoon from the 3rd Marine Infantry Battalion. In total, there were about 150 armed Argentines on the island. Okay, so when you talk, so 150, that's not too much. Uh, however, you do need to consider that they were pretty well dug in. Obviously, when you're defending anything, you have the time to, to be a little more monotonous and plan around certain attacks. However, they definitely weren't expecting the, the SAS to, to do what they're going to do. Going against the SAS is a very hard thing to plan around just because even if things aren't necessarily easy for, for them to infiltrate or, you know, exfil or, or what have you, the SAS are very well trained, so they're very adaptive. They can pretty much do anything on the spots. Um, so it's going to be hard to work around that. You need to really do a lot of planning to make sure that it's it's considered. So you definitely need to consider the SAS's track record and their success. You know, with their professionalism and discipline, it's going to be um, pretty hard to, to work around that. Again, the United Kingdom did put in their own work as far as doing their own reconnaissance and gathering, you know, intelligence to make sure that the raid was successful. But they were putting more emphasis on destroying the, the uh, aircraft than they were to supporting the SAS, just because it was a little bit harder for them to, to actually sustain that. So again, the SAS, when, when you're trying to get someone to go and do something and you want them to be uh, you know, uh, autonomous and self-sustaining, the SAS are going to do it. Elements of the SAS were already aboard the flagship, the carrier HMS Hermes. The plan was to insert boat troop D Squadron 22 SAS by Klepper Canoe to conduct a reconnaissance of the airfield, followed by the rest of the squadron attacking the aircraft, the radar site, the ground crews, and the Marines before being taken off by helicopter. The recce element reported strong headwinds that would reduce the assault window from 90 to 30 minutes from the Hermes launch point, so the plan was changed. Destroying the aircraft was now the priority, with everything else as a secondary priority, time permitting. On the night of the 14th of May 1982, a pair of Westland Sea King HC-4 helicopters set off from Hermes with 45 SAS aboard. They landed 3.7 miles or 6 kilometers from the airstrip. The SAS were armed with American M16 rifles, many with underslung grenade launchers. Okay, so that specific M16 with that handguard and the 203, uh, the M203 grenade launcher underneath, I actually used that exact same weapon system when I was in the Marines. And I have to say, I just love the look of it. It just looks so cool. Uh, you know, it just, I don't know why it does, but when you look at pictures from like Vietnam and like even the 1980s, you see people using that weapon. I don't know, it just, it looks so cool because you always have these old gruff recon dudes or like special operators like these guys just using it and holding it, it looks so sick. And uh, it, yeah, it's cool that they're able to use our, our uh, weapon, our rifle during their, uh, during their raid, you know, it gives me a little more pride in being able to, you know, hold the same weapon that these badasses had. I don't know why, it's just, uh, I'm sort of fanboying, I guess, but I love that weapon, it just looks so cool. Each man also carried two bombs for the 81 millimeter mortar, and many also had the L1A1 66 millimeter lore a light anti-tank rocket. And the law is also very, very cool, very fun. You know, you just, you, you extend it and it's pretty much ready to go. It's very easy to use. 
you have like a little bit of an uh, like a, an arming switch on top and then you just have like this this rubber button that you just depress to actually launch it uh, i don't think any militaries really use this too much anymore just because they're very old uh, but it's a very very cool it's very very fun to shoot as well Supporting the SAS offshore was HMS Glamorgan, a destroyer, and the frigate HMS Broadsword. The SAS approached the airstrip without detection. Dodging marine sentries, they slipped among the aircraft and laid charges. At the given signal, the charges were blown, and the SAS raked the aircraft with automatic fire and anti-tank rockets. At the same time, HMS Glamorgan opened fire, shelling the airfield's buildings, stores, and defensive positions. That's awesome. The Argentine Marines only attacked as the SAS were withdrawing. <laughs> one British soldier was injured, and one Argentine officer killed. All the SAS made it back to the helicopters and were extracted back to Hermes. It was a textbook operation, and the damage inflicted on Argentine aircraft significant. Six Pucaras were destroyed or damaged, along with four Turbo Mentors and the Skyvan. The SAS had once again lived up to its motto, Who Dares Wins. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share, and also support my channel at PayPal and Patreon. Details. Okay, that was a very, very awesome video, and it did do a very good job of, uh, you know, giving it a, a broad background. Again, you can sort of get into the specifics of it, but with an operation that was this clean, you know, it, it's just, it's awesome to read about, and it's awesome to, to see videos on it. And again, when you have, like, the whole combined arms where you have, you know, they have the explosives, they're engaging it with, you know, rocket launchers and uh, automatic weapons, and then you have the naval gunfire. It's just, it's so awesome to see all of that come together. And they even said that the Argentine Marines weren't attacking until they're actually, uh, the SAS were actually exfilling. And that's probably because the whole shock and awe of being raided and having all these explosives going off, but it would just, it would stun you. It would take a while for you to actually understand what's happening. You know, so I'm sure a lot of them were like sleeping and stuff too. So it, it was definitely a shock and awe for the Argentine Marines, I bet. Um, so that's probably why it, it took them a while to actually get organized and, and start, you know, suppressing the, the SAS or firing at them. But again, this is a very textbook raid, a very solid operation. And when you're talking about the whole planning and reconnaissance and intelligence aspect, uh, again, when you're talking about special operations, yes, you can plan on them, you know, making up for the slack of, of reconnaissance or intelligence. However, special operations needs the good intelligence. When you're talking about these high value missions, the intelligence and the, the reconnaissance is pretty much essential or else, you know, you're sending these, these highly trained guys into a very uh, unknown situation. And you, you obviously don't want to do that. So kudos to the SAS, kudos to the, the planning and the reconnaissance. You know, doing a, a reconnaissance on a canoe already is pretty scary, uh, but that's, that's, it's so cool to know that that was a part of this whole operation. But let, let me know what you guys think about the video. If you have any more information about this particular raid or, or any, any raids that are similar to this, especially that happened during the Falcons War, definitely let me know in the, uh, in the comments section. It's really cool to hear about these things. In the U.S., you don't really uh, hear exactly, you don't, you don't really focus on these other raids that other countries do. Obviously, there's so much time you can actually learn certain things in school, so you're going to focus on what your country has done. But it's really cool to learn these other things because you're sort of missing a whole lot of military history if you're just focusing on your one country. So it's very cool to check these out. But if you guys like the video, definitely feel free to hit that thumbs up and definitely consider subscribing. It really helps support the channel and I do appreciate it. It's cool to have this community when we have all these people sharing their experiences and sharing these recommendations. And it, it really helps me develop as, you know, still being in the military, I can see what all these other units are doing and how they implement certain things and how they implement their equipment. And it sort of gives me, you know, tools for my toolbox to, to help me out and help, uh, you know, other soldiers out and whatnot. But again, if you guys like the video, definitely feel free to let me know. Feel free to send those recommendations in the comments. That is it for this video, so I will see y'all in the next one.